Welcome back to the Blue Chip Breakdown of All Spans. I'm your host, Bull. We have a lot of exciting things to cover over the next few days, starting off with our baseball team heading down to Tuscaloosa tomorrow to face Alabama in a three-game series and kick off SEC play. We need to bring the broom out for this one. Number one, because it's Alabama. Number two, baseball is such a long season. You want to start off the right way, especially in conference play. And we've also got our basketball team playing in the SEC tournament tomorrow at 7 p.m. I'm hoping that this game will be versus Mississippi State because that could potentially be a quad one victory for us. And then the second game, I believe, will be versus Auburn. If we beat them, that's two potential quad one victories heading into Selection Sunday. And as much as I've talked about our team wanting to maybe lose early in the SEC tournament and take a break heading into the NCAA tournament, we might as well just win the whole thing, okay? Let's just go ahead and do that. We're trying to fend off North Carolina from getting our number one seed. And we don't want that two seed because I don't know if we'll necessarily just switch places with North Carolina, but everywhere that I've looked, they are on the same side as UConn. You don't want to play UConn before you get to like a final four or a championship situation. And really the best case scenario would be if UConn loses before you even have to face them. Now I do think that our balls could beat them head to head, but you want to take the easiest route possible. I just want to win a championship. I've said that a million times on this channel. We've also got spring practice starting up for our football team coming up four days from today on Monday, and we're going to have a whole lot of coverage on that. But today's video is going to be about some of Nick Saban's comments with Congress and the roundtable deal that they had. I want to talk about how a potential schedule could look for the big two, and I don't know when that's going to happen, but I am anticipating that it will probably happen by 2026. And the biggest things that we'll be talking about is how the conferences, schedules, and playoffs will look. As far as how my model goes, and again, this is going to be just like a rough draft model, right? This is like if I'm sitting down at the table with the people who are deciding on how this whole thing is going to go, what my proposal would be. And, you know, again, I can't emphasize this enough. It's just a rough draft model, something for us to just kind of think on. And maybe we can build off of this and get all the little small details fine tuned. But before we get into it, as always, do us a really big favor, like and subscribe to the channel. All right, so first we have to address Nick Saban's hypocritical comments in front of Congress at that roundtable. Number one, comes out and says that he doesn't want the players getting paid themselves and that the players are not about developing themselves and growing, and that's what he's all about. And he doesn't want to see the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. But Nick, you got paid $10 plus million plus a season plus endorsements. So what do you mean? Like, you, you, can't, you can't say that you want to make all this money. And you're not going to let the players do it. That makes absolutely no sense. And you know that. And I honestly think that's a really bad look for Alabama. It's a bad look for the SEC. It's a bad look for the NCAA. And the NCAA is facing some major <laughs> court cases worth billions of dollars. I think that they'll probably talk to Nick Saban on the side and say, hey, we don't want you to come up here and speak anymore because you're really kind of showing why we needed this change like you're for for him to be able to be so bold to get up and actually say these things on national tv is mind-blowing like do you know how that sounds do you have any idea how that sounds to the average person he's very out of touch someone is going to pull him to the side and i think that he's more than likely going to stop making these types of comments and participating uh in these round tables and all that type of stuff because it's a really bad look so he also okay you know like we talked about, he wants to see the players get paid from a revenue sharing perspective, which would essentially mean that all of that revenue goes to the institutions and then the institutions decide how to pay these players. I kind of like a little bit of that. But for me, I would rather have a salary in place first and foremost, and then we bring the revenue sharing in. We'll talk about that some more. I'm not done with saving just yet. You talk about the rich getting richer, the poor getting poor. Where I talked about how much money you was making compared to the players. That's laughable. And I think it's actually very insulting. But you also have to think about it from this perspective. Alabama had some sort of a system in place. And we saw it a lot with, uh, you know, the assistants that have left from Alabama, not to mention Kirby Smart, okay? Because a lot of people tend to overlook Georgia in all of these conversations and have no idea why. Georgia is doing what Alabama did and then some, okay? Every dangerous situation, anything, any issue that we have with any college institution, Georgia's doing it, okay? People are dying down in Athens. 
And I don't, you know, I'm not trying to make a lot of that by any means, but it's a very serious situation. Why aren't we pointing the finger at Kirby Smart and at UGA and saying, hey, y'all need to come forward. Y'all need to, you know, we need to get this cleaned up. What they're doing down there is out of control. But I won't go too far into that. Y'all already know how, how I feel about Georgia. And at some point, hopefully I can kind of divulge a little bit more as to exactly why I feel the way that I do about them. But just know that they're big time cheating. So if you want to point the finger at Connor Stallions in Michigan, at uh, Alabama and Nick Saban, you better be pointing some fingers at Kirby Smart and UGA as well. Back to Nick Saban and Alabama. They had a system in place that, as far as I understand from the information that I've gathered over the past decade or so, what Alabama was doing is they were giving players cars, especially chargers, under some leases. And the players didn't own them. And if you were a higher caliber blue chip player, you got a little bit of money under the table. But none of it was what the players were actually worth. And none of it was actually creating value, as Nick Saban continues to say, for any of these players. It was just like, hey, you know, you are a young person, a young student athlete. And if I can entice you with a bunch of things that have no real value, then I'm, you know, that's what we're going to do. And that's, you know, again, that's what they did. And, you know, I think that that just looks so bad. I mean, I don't know if he understands how bad that looks. I don't think that Alabama necessarily gets it at this point. But as much backlash that's come out since Nick Saban has been speaking, and, you know, I feel like they might be getting it now. So Alabama, the SEC, and the NCAA will probably come out, especially the NCAA, because they're facing billion dollars worth of lawsuits. I think that they'll probably say, hey, Saban, maybe keep your opinion a little bit more to yourself uh, because it it looks absolutely terrible. Every lawyer that I've heard speak on this has said the exact same thing, and they're going to get slaughtered, uh, you know, whenever it comes to court time, as far as I'm concerned from where I sit. So I don't like what Saban is doing. He's extremely hypocritical. You know, again, what his program was doing is something that was kind of unmatched. Now, different programs did different things. Like, you know, we talked about Georgia. They definitely got a system in place. It's not exactly what Alabama had, but no one's checking them on it. So as long as it's working, I mean, it's extremely beneficial. And the rich are continuing to get richer and the poor are continuing to get poor because Alabama, like how many, uh, you know, NCAA violations have they faced since Saban has been there? I don't know if they faced any, you know, I haven't seen any penalties come down on Alabama or UGA. So both of those two programs have benefited tremendously from a pre-NIL era. And us as Tennessee fans, and I would say as fans throughout the entire country, you should be more happy about this than a lot of people are. A lot of people are upset, but this is this can, okay? I'm not going to say that it is because we don't know what it will end up being, but it can end up creating a much more balanced playing field uh, from several perspectives. Let's talk about what I would do in this situation. And this is a rough draft. This is just what I would be presenting early on in the process if I was on the you know round table of whoever is making decisions for the Power 2 conferences. I would come to them and I would say, listen, number one, we want the players on salary because once you put them on salary, now what you can do is you can create something where it can be even and the Title IX issues don't really matter. The salaries might not be that much, but the benefit will outweigh the negatives because now that they're on contract, okay, with the salary and they are paid employees of these institutions, we can say, hey, there's a limit on how much you can transfer. We can start to really set some real rules and we can enforce it in court. Now, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I could be off on some of this stuff, but this is just my rough draft. This is just how I see it. That's what I would do. There's going to be a salary, number one. And the salary would have to be even for pretty much all sports. I think that that would help to save several sports, maybe not all of them, but at least the ones that are generating some sort of revenue. Now, the next part that I would do is actually implement something that Nick Saban said uh, in the revenue sharing, because that could end up helping with the salary expenses. I think that some needs to come from boosters and people donating to the different institutions. And then, you know, the rest of it can come from revenue sharing. That way, it's not so much money having to come out of these boosters' pockets. I think that that's huge. Now, I know some of y'all are probably going to be asking about NIL. Understand that NIL uh, is kind of like endorsements for professional players. It's the exact same thing. And whatever you can get from an NIL perspective is just what you can get. That's going to be based off of you, uh, you know, how popular you are, how marketable you are. That's how you will get that NIL money. 
But I feel like schools and institutions can still, if they can find a way to add some money from, you know, boosters and all that to NIL, then do that by all means. You know, I'm fine with that. I just think that we've got to make sure that there's some sort of a solid contract. The players are employees so that we can put them, uh, you know, under some real rules. And it's not all crazy to me. The biggest problem with college football is with that transfer portal. And I think that that definitely there needs to be a limit put on that. And I feel like college football fans should enjoy that. Like one of the biggest things is you don't know who's going to be on your team from year to year. And we're saying, oh, it's not as much passion, but that's what I would do. Okay, I would make it. Uh, a salary that's based off of revenue sharing and also based off of boosters. All right, now on to the scheduling. I believe that the SEC and the Big Ten will go on to be essentially the AFC and the NFC is going to be a two-conference system. We've talked about this a lot on this channel. But the first thing that would have to happen is the conferences would need to have an even number of teams. I set it at 20 just to kind of start it off. And we all know that these guys are very greedy, so they'll probably add some more as time kind of goes on. But 20 was the easiest number for me to kind of calculate a schedule that made some sort of sense. So for the Big Ten, I've got them adding Notre Dame, Virginia Tech, and potentially Pitt. You could throw some other teams in there. It doesn't really matter. Notre Dame, I would say, is a lock. And then, you know, whatever the other team will be is who they will be. The Big Ten is starting off with 18 teams, so they can only add two. The SEC has 16 teams, so they can add four. I've got Clemson, Florida State, Miami, and North Carolina. Again, y'all let me know y'all's thoughts down in the comment section. You can mix and match that however you want to. But those teams make the most sense to me. So we've got the conferences balanced out. Now let's talk about the schedules. And I told y'all, I pretty much went off of the NFL's model. And this is what their model looks like as far as how they make their schedules. First thing is six games against divisional opponents, two games per team, one at home and one on the road, four games against teams from a division within its conference, two games at home and two on the road, two games against teams from the two remaining divisions in his own conference, one game at home and one on the road. Matchups are based on division ranking from the previous season. The 17th game is an additional game against a non-conference opponent from a division that the team is not scheduled to play. Matchups are based on division rankings from the previous season. So we know that the NFL has 32 teams with two conferences and four divisions inside of each of those conferences made up of four teams. In my model for college football at the highest level, I've got 40 teams with two conferences and also four divisions made up of five teams. All right, so we will set our schedules up with five games versus divisional opponents. You get three at home, and then you get two away. Obviously, that's going to rotate from year to year. And then you get three games versus non-divisional conference opponents. What that means is if you're in the SEC, whatever team is not in your division, you will you know, be able to play three of those opponents every single year. And that will also rotate. You get one game at home and then you get two games away. All right. Next, you get four games versus the opposite conference, one from each division. You get two at home and then you get two away. All of that will rotate as well. All right. And finally, I really like the idea of creating parity by having the previous season's division winners play up against the other division winners in the following season. I think that that really makes sense. So having a schedule that is almost based off of your previous season schedule, for the most part, makes sense to me. All right, and something else that I would do to add parity to this league is allow teams the option to play in some games with some big-time sponsors and generate some more revenue to share with their program on their bye weeks, okay? Now, these games are essentially exhibition games. They don't count towards your overall rankings in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It's just a way to generate some more revenue if you want to do that, okay? Now, I don't think that teams that necessarily have a, you know, really good team, probably like a championship caliber team, would want to participate in two of these games, but maybe they'll want to participate in one of them just to get some more revenue. But for the most part, the teams that have will say, hey, we don't need to do that. We would much rather let our players rest as opposed to putting them out there with the potential of injury. But for some of these, I guess, lower tier teams, even though they're pretty much all on a relatively even playing field, they can say, hey, man, we got to be able to generate some more funds, some more revenue. So we're going to play in some of these games. And maybe it could turn into something that is prestigious. And, you know, it's a way just to kind of have some fun, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know exactly how it's going to end up looking in the long run, but that's just something that I wanted to throw out there because we're 
hearing that basketball is going to have a tournament like that uh, where, you know, each team is going to get paid at least a million dollars that participates in this tournament. Now, I'm not saying do a tournament. I'm just saying that, you know, whatever teams have a bye week on the same weeks have the option of, you know, maybe playing up against one another. Or I guess the big sponsors will say, hey, we like this matchup. We like this matchup. And they can start some bidding, things like that. You know, I feel like all of that would be taking place before the season starts. So I know it's not a perfect model. Some of y'all are just going to absolutely hate that. I'm just kind of spitballing and uh, throwing something out there. All right. And I'm sure another question for y'all would be, how are the rankings going to look? You know, how are we going to be able to rank these teams? Because they're not all playing one another. I think that it's going to be very similar to the ranking model that we have right now. Okay. It's going to be strength of schedule, uh, you know, style points, all that. Like whatever they're using right now, you can pretty much use the exact same thing because now we've got 40 really, you know, again, very evenly matched teams for the most part. Like there's a very even floor that is elevated above the floor that we have right now in college football. Uh, you know, where like, let's say, maybe we're going to be starting off on like the 50th floor. We've got a lot of teams that, you know, their ceiling is at like floor 30. So it's not even, it's not the same. And as much as we like to pretend that it is and, you know, pretend that everyone has a chance to win a national championship, they don't, they really never have, and they really never will. So to me, it's best just to kind of get those teams out of the way into their own league where they can create their own parity. And now they really do have a chance to fight for some championships. I think that that's important. I think that that's more fair than the model that we have currently, but I want to go ahead and get into the playoffs as well. My 14-team playoff bracket is going to look very similar to the NFLs where the number one seeds from each conference gets a first-round bye, and they also get the benefit of playing up against the lowest-ranked team that is left throughout the playoffs. And the conference finals will be very similar to what it is in the NFL. That's going to be the conference championships. I know this is something that's really big for the SEC and the Big Ten they wanted to keep their conference championships because they make so much money off of them. And also they wanted for them to mean something. Well, I think that this is the best way to make it mean as much as possible. Whoever wins goes on to the national championship. All right. And this is not a perfect model by any means, but I think that the SEC and the Big Ten would like a model along these lines because they both have everything very even. There's an equal opportunity to win a national championship. And I think that they would go for something along these lines. But let me know y'all thoughts down in the comment section. And as always, thank you so much for staying all the way to the end. Please make sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, share with your friends, family, and other volunteer fans. And we'll see you all in the next one. Thanks. Peace.